Hey brothers and sisters, welcome to Future Faith, a podcast newsletter and publication about living faithfully in an age of democratic destruction, ecological collapse, and economic irrelevance. Available for free on Substack, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. I did pretty good for remembering that considering I'm not looking at a teleprompter right now. Today's episode is a little bit different. We're actually doing a live interview with Mark Sayers. Mark Sayers is the author of a bunch of books, including Reappearing Church. As you can see, it's very well worn in the Brock household. Um, He's written a bunch of books. He's a pastor at a church called Red Church in Melbourne, uh, Australia, if you want to check out their church. He's also the uh, half half of a podcast called This Cultural Moment with John Mark Comer. Uh, and he's also the host of the Rebuilders podcast. So lots of stuff um, for Mark to check out. Today's top uh, topics of conversations, massive. We talk about China, we talk about cryptocurrency, we talk about the future of faith and, and how the church can respond to some of the biggest um, challenges in the world right now. So I really hope you get a lot out of this. Grab a coffee, grab a tea, grab a pen and paper, and the next hour is just going to be an amazing conversation. I really hope you enjoy it. So uh, welcome, Mark. Thanks for being on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Great to be here. Um, I don't know if you've read Niall Ferguson's book, The Tower and the Square, but he envisioned society as a war between hierarchies and networks. And what I love about you is that you're not this huge fame and power guy, just a quiet and faithful influence guy. And I have been sensing that the impact of your network is going to have a far greater reach than any sort of insta-famous celebrity persona you could have crafted for yourself so I don't know if you if that resonates with you but that's what it does yeah yeah. that's encouraging yeah it's what I've been I've been thinking about the tower and square as I've been prepping for this conversation so right off the bat you're in Australia and um, you can't believe everything you see on Twitter but it's sounding quite authoritarian compared to most countries with your travel restrictions and banning protests and the recent amendment to allow digital surveillance um, what's it like on the ground and how is it affecting Red Church's ministry? Yeah, very different. <laughs> it's the first thing I would say. So it has been funny getting messages from overseas. And um, yeah, so uh, most of Australia has been open for the whole pandemic. And there's been like, you know, whole like I think Canberra didn't have a, a you know, a case for 400 days. Wow. And so Australia had a zero COVID approach. And what's probably been really interesting is Australia probably because maybe it's because of its region, probably was more in, in conversation with places like Singapore and, and have, that's probably more, you know, South Korea, um, how we've handled things. Um, so the other interesting thing is that Australia to, I think it's a place which other people from overseas, particularly in the West will often misread. And Australians are very, uh, I think, are individualistic like the rest of the West. But when there's actually a crisis, we're very collective. And there's an interesting book written by the New York Times, um, uh, bureau chief for Sydney. So he's an American who lived in Australia and he wrote a book about how differently Australians approach risk. So things like bushfires. So very much um, the sort of collective response that you saw of lockdowns was actually very popular. Um, the the pr- premier who brought it in, you know, was wildly popular. Um, and it's been almost this very different reality. So in Australia, the Australian public wanted the government to completely deal with it and have no cases. Um, so to give you an example on the ground, I was at the kids soccer practice before our last lockdown and just talking to parents and the, everyone was saying, when is the government going to lock us down? <laughs> so there was this desire to lock it down. And I think it's, it's Australia. I was, I was in the British library and there was a book and I was reading about, I think it's the seven cities of the British empire or something. And one was Melbourne. And it was really interesting. It said the, the author was a British, came to, came to Melbourne and looked at Melbourne and, uh, you know, made this comment that, you know, how we identify ourselves very much now is if you go around Melbourne, you see stories about our Indigenous past and then you see stories of multiculturalism. But he said the missing part is this really well-run British city by bureaucrats. And mm-hmm. that's so Melbourne. So uh, it's very much this idea that people wanted the government to get rid of the virus um, and that's what would happen. We would lock down, the virus would go away. But where we are now, we, we were just, we we're out of lockdown. We we're approaching 92 to 94% vaccinated. Canberra hit 100% vaccinated. Wow. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's a completely different approach. So we'll, we'll do, we'll go, Australians, there's this interesting line in that book by the New York Times author where he said, Americans want to be great. Australians want a great life. 
So Australians go, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be locked down for two years. We'll do that. But we just want to go at the end of it, we're going to go to the barbecue. We're going to go to football. It's mm-hmm. so like everything's opening up here, um, which is really interesting. So you're sort of seeing Europe, uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe sort of hitting it now. So yeah, now, sorry, this is a long answer. Uh, <laughs> I also think what happened was um, Australia it was, was viewed in a particular way. Australia and New Zealand's response as well because it's been used as a political football, mm-hmm. particularly in the US. Mm-hmm. So there was like, there was one video that was flying around that was from four years ago, the police hitting a guy with their car. It had nothing to do with protests. It was, it was police bumping someone with their car. So um, yeah, so it's been nothing like people mm. have yeah, perceived it. You know, there's been, um, you know, Victoria's been more locked down my city than others, but um, it's been really good. And interesting, the, the, the prime minister is a conservative evangelical who's been at the top of all of this from our conservative party. It's so strange. So, yeah, so very different. My, my screenwriting partner lives in Sydney and he's a hyper libertarian, owns millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin and he's anti-vaxxer and like took his newborn to like a, a rally against any sort of lockdown. So there definitely is that like individualist anti-culture even in Australia, but it's just nothing compared to like the South no. and much of America. No. Yeah. Yeah, and so, our conservatism yeah. is very anti-libertarian. So interesting. So the conservatives want the government to control things well. Wow. So yeah, the difference between small government and simply just having good government. Yeah, and so in, in Sydney, the government, the what what that person would have been protesting against was actually a very right-wing faction of the conservative government was bringing in that lockdown. Gotcha, gotcha. And so Red Church, what's it been like for you? Um, obviously yeah. you haven't been as locked down, but. Mm. Well, we, we have in Melbourne. So Melbourne yeah. had a long, the longest lockdown. Um, yeah. So we didn't get to meet um, heaps in the last two years. There's been really interesting, like sorting, uh, sifting time. And um, yeah, it's just been fascinating where it's, it's really moved us away from any pretense of being cultural Christians <laughs> and, and just coming because people wanted to come so it's been this thing of having to press in and it's just it's revolutionized that church i think it's mm. it's 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 some people left and some people deconstructed faith a lot of stuff you've seen in other places but we really pushed into discipleship and very early on we said you know god is releasing you to you've got to take responsibility for your discipleship we can mm. only do so much through a screen you know and we tried yeah. to you know we did pastoral care and reached out to people um so we met for the first time back um last week uh, so this weekend passed and yeah it was it was really good to see everyone and I, our expectations are really lowered and it just feels like it's about god and the spirit and, and you know what he's doing and yeah i'm really excited about the future that's great we had a men's retreat last weekend a bunch of us went away for the weekend and boy oh boy it is good for brothers to be together in unity it's we really felt it um what stories and developments are you tracking right now in culture? What's kind of, what are you fixating on? What does your wife say? <laughs> Stop talking about Mark. <laughs> I'm finding it really difficult because there's so many like uh, bubbling saucepans. Yeah. Um, so definitely, I think there is the environment um, is a big one. I think it's coming. It's, it's one I'm not naturally interested in, but I can just see it, you know, COP26, you can see the politics of it uh, are becoming bigger and, mm. And becoming more widespread and, and just noticing little things like you're starting to hear about like all the frogs are dying in Australia and you're like what you know the kids are coming and tell you this stuff so it's really interesting I think how that's going to become more of an issue um I, I'm definitely looking at the geopolitical reshift there's there's a complete configuration um a reconfiguration rather happening in the world we're going from a unipolar US-led world order to mm. this this reshaping but then also really interesting even regionalization at a local level, um, you know, anything from Scottish independence to, I just was reading about this call for now, a new California. So the, the central rural parts to break away, and the Western Cape of South Africa. And um, so there's this, seems like there's, it's just like the tectonic plates are shifting. Um, and I think that's even true of our political spectrum as well. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's less left and right. You've got sort of old left and right, this libertarian thing, there's sort of new things beginning. Um, so looking at, reshaping of geopolitics environment our relationship to nature Mm -hmm. i I think politics is changing i think technology obviously is is a huge huge thing and i sort of feel like 
it's been funny. I've been watching the X Files <laughs> late. That's probably what my wife would say. Um, uh, uh, you know, you, I'm watching a lot. She watches it sometimes with me, but I'm actually watching it because I feel like we're returning to something of that moment in the mm. '90s where there was this questioning. I remember that, that show when it first came out. There was almost this like, oh wow, this is you know, you had Sc- uh, Dana Scully who was the rationalist, and then Mulder who was sort of the um, questioner and I feel like we're moving back like reason and rationality which is defined modernity is really sort of up in the air now mm-hmm. it feels like um, so I'm sort of watching that as well uh, but yeah rise of China um, metaverse there are so mm-hmm. many things I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah watching so many things at this point in time um, probably not a good idea we just had a newborn six or seven weeks ago and I've been uh, I just Late at night, I've been watching, uh, after my work is done, I've been watching um, Black Mirror and yes. uh, like talk about super dark and uh, dystopian and terrifying. Uh, the, the the show's creator, Charlie Booker, he's, the show hasn't been canceled, but they haven't made another series. And his reason is he said, I don't know if our society can handle it anymore because I can't, I can't go any darker. We're already seeing a lot of this lived out in reality, these social credit systems and all this stuff. He's like, what can I, what can I write about? That's not just going to make people like jump off bridges. It's very mm. strange. Yes. Um, so I want to unpack four major changes in the post COVID world mm. with you, just kind of rapid fire mm. round. Uh, the first one uh, is politics as competing bands of ideological extremists. Mm. Yes. We're definitely seeing like, you know, if, if in many ways the 90s, I think it was defined by this centrism, for, for want of a better word. And, you know, Anthony Giddens, the British philosopher, talked about a third way, you know, which you had Bill Clinton and Tony mm-hmm. Blair and Gerhard Schroeder in Germany trying to come to the middle. Um, but definitely we're seeing this new ideology. And I think it's it's part of my read of this. I could, I could, I could give a political read of this, but I'd also give a religious read. And I think that... Um, uh, Francis Fukuyama, who, who was spoke about the end of history and sort of proclaimed this centrist moment, you know, talked about content free, you know, like mm-hmm. cultures need to be content free. And I think that really what we're seeing with this ideological extremism and these different bands and there's everything from, you know, radical sort of critical theory to radical libertarianism mm-hmm. to, you know, returns of different nationalism, and fascism, and then just completely weird new mashups. And, and I've even been fascinated, like there's a lot of talk about white supremacy but then there's all this like fascinating like around the world like it like i was reading about malay the the nazi movement growing amongst malay people in like there's there's these these nazi malay bands in like indonesia and like you know malaysia and stuff like this in india um you got this sort of rise of this sort of hindu almost the the modi uh, Modi. yeah yeah so so it's not just happening in the West, it's, it's happening everywhere. And it's sort of this return to what's sort of called a civilizational state versus just, you know, a multicultural national, you know, sort mm-hmm. of like content free. So, but I actually think what's going on there, what's going on there is it's humans desire religion <laughs> and we re- desire a bigger story. And I think mm-hmm. that 90s thing of, again, think about the X-Files, that, you know, here's your life, go to Walmart, have your job, die, mm-hmm. be nice, you know, buy a new sweater. Like people did are rejecting that. So I think that that actually, I know a lot of believers are, are concerned about the rise of, you know, ideology and politics seems to be getting more religious, but actually that's a sign, I think, that the West, which seemed to be almost this narcotic, this secular blanket put on, on culture, it's not mm-hmm. working. Mm-hmm. And people are hungering for deeper meaning, bigger stories, something to die for. You know, I think that that's what's happening. Mm. Interesting. Um, I heard an interesting phrase this week. They're calling it long political COVID. How the decisions wow. being made right now, we are going to be feeling the impacts, for instance, of inflation for the next decade. We're never going to get back our lost freedoms like after 9-11. Um, the, there's, I actually have an article um, that's being published today on the different separatist movements in the world right now. There wow. are hundreds. hundreds yes, of yes. Them. But, but it's sort of like, if, if we understand individualism as an anti-culture, we realize that it's like porn. It just more and more categories mm. get created over mm. time. People have mm. to have. So it makes sense that we're going to see more sovereignties in the future. Mm. It's probably going to be corporate sovereignties before it's going to be like cultural ones. But mm. I suspect after I think COVID was the warm up crisis. I think the next crisis yes. is what's going to be like 
really shattering through the glass and we'll see a lot of, of yes. geopolitical change. Yes. And it could be multiple. I think like what I'm starting yeah. to realize is, you know, in, in a system where there's multiple crises, they start to bounce off each other. Yeah. Um, and it's a, there's a great line in, I just read Adam Tooze's book, um, Shut Down, which is about the economy and COVID. Mm-hmm. And he just made this really interesting point that um, he said politicians, like he talked about the stimulus, like the massive stimulus packages around the world and mm-hmm. borrowing and all this. And he said like governments had to do more and more, so I'm paraphrasing, but almost governments had to do increasingly radical things to keep everything normal. <laughs> I thought that's a fascinating concept that, you know, like these, let's borrow all this money and, and print money because we want you to think it's all exactly the same. So I feel like yeah. that's going to continue. So this weird thing of like, oh, there's an environmental crisis. There's a war over here. Here's this technological thing. But governments are scrambling to make everything look like it did in 2019. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that trend will continue. Sort of weird and normal all at the same time. Crazy. And of course, it's only normal for those of us who are wealthy enough to vote. The, yes. It's the suffering's as bad as ever for people who, who aren't the target demographic. Um, the yes. second major challenge uh, in the post-COVID world is the bipolar world, uh, West versus mm. China. You want to unpack that really mm. quick? Yeah, I, I think China is, I mean, probably feel it in the Pacific here. Yeah. Um, I know in Canada, it's been a big issue in, in all throughout the South China Sea, Australia. Um, Europe's probably not caught up to it in the same way. Uh, but the rise of China is, I just think, such a disruptor um, moment. And, you know, you look at, there's a few things, you know, the predictions that China will um you know, go past the US's GDP in the next 10 years. Like people don't, I often say that at stats and people are like, oh, okay. But you don't realize that like, if you've got a bigger GDP, you've got a bigger army, you've mm-hmm. got a bigger everything. And, you know, there's still large parts of China that's still, um, you know, st- still under, you know, lower, you know, or po- poverty is still mm-hmm. there. But just the influence of China. And, and also, um, you know, second, th- there was also that China did the hypersonic missile um, Crazy. Uh, recently. And, you know, it was almost a Sputnik moment where the U.S. military is like, we don't know how that happened. How mm-hmm. are you guys doing that? And that means you can strike anywhere in the world. Also, yeah, for, folks, for those who don't, who yeah. haven't heard, China basically sent a, a missile that could have easily been equipped with a nuclear warhead and they sent it around the world before the U.S. realized what happened. That means you could drown, you can nuke anything. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a massive leap. Also, the head of the Pentagon's AI division quit. Uh, just recently and was like, China's beaten us, I give up sort of thing. So, you know, there's this really interesting space race or, you know, technological race going on. But then the other interesting thing is that I think what a lot of people are not not aware of is that I think it's something, I I could get this wrong, but I think a third of the money that has gone into the global economy in the last sort of 10 years has come from China. So this, this, what's happened in the world is wages haven't gone up, but the reason that hasn't affected people is because China just started making cheap stuff. So if your wages aren't going up, but if TVs and you know your iPhone and everything is is cheaper, it doesn't affect you. But what's interesting happening now, China's got this new concept called dual circulation. So what they've got is before they were completely inter- yeah, intermeshed with the world economy. So the argument was China's not going to do anything, take over Taiwan or create a conflict or pushback because they're so interwoven and you know it's going to ruin their business. But Xi is moving things now to possibly where they could turn off the tap and almost go it alone. You know, for example, luxury brands now increasingly Chinese are being encouraged to buy their own luxury brands to store food. Uh, you know, stopping kids playing computer games and, you know, so on. Um, and I, I really want to be careful here not to try and bash per se, because you know, it can be a sort of cheap sport at the mm-hmm. moment. But more the point is China has deeply affected how everyone in the world lives because they've provided cheap stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's actually benefited our, um, our lifestyle. Secondly, the world has been in this place where we haven't had a problem with employment globally because you had this massive migration, billion people, many moving from Chinese rural areas to the coastal cities to build stuff for us to buy. That's that's now dried up. Mm. So China has a huge demographic challenge. And um, so China sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold is the saying. So China is heading in a new direction. Uh, Xi, is, it's fascinating what you're hearing coming out of Chinese intellectuals. They don't want to be the West. They're looking at the US and particularly even since after the capital rights, we don't want that sort of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, things happening here. So China's going to change now um, and change how they do things. And that's going to have a huge global effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fourth or the third um, 
major change post COVID is uh, the the metaverse. Yes, yeah, yeah the metaverse. <laughs> well, I think the metaverse was coming for a long time, yes. yeah. and and in some ways it was it was virtual reality, and I think that original ideas of virtual reality was that, you know, you would enter sort of your senses into this, what felt like a real space. Mm -hmm. But I think what's different about it is it's virtual reality plus a new form of the market and the conglomerations. So, you know, I heard recently Ariana Grande, the singer, did a concert in Fortnite. And, you know, I think about my kids who play Minecraft, it's a natural progression for them mm -hmm. to yes. then think about these, these 3D spaces. So it'll be more like you'll have, you know, you'd be playing in Fortnite, there's a concert, you know, Ariana Grande's playing, there'll be a Nike store there, NFTs, crypto. Mm -hmm. It's going to be this entire um, sort of area. What I find interesting is there is sort of this battle at the moment between big tech and um, and, and big business, particularly you know, Elon Musk and Tesla and you know, Jeff Bezos and Amazon, and then regulation. So like, um, if you go back to the 19th century in the United States, you had the robber barons, they called mm -hmm. them the railroad kings. And they sort of broke them up with antitrust laws because their financial wealth actually began to influence, um, you know, the political system. And one of Plato's sort of things was democracy would turn into oligarchy because yeah. it would, you know, have this sort of you know, so really democratic um, sort of liberal democracy had this pushback on the power of big corporations. Mm. If you go into a translocational metaverse. <laughs> What jurisdiction are you in? Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting question. We've already had that, you know, like the Premier League football in in England's had this um, thing around, you know, online abuse, and they've arrested some people um, who are abusing players online. But then there was a lot of them who were in other countries. Mm -hmm. So where where's the jurisdiction now? If you've got two people meeting in the metaverse, someone from Indonesia and someone from Turkmenistan, and something happens and goes down, and someone insults someone, what, what's the jurisdiction? Or if someone rips someone off with a, with a cryptocurrency <laughs> exchange or slanders someone, so in some ways, I think it's it's. Um, Jill Lepore had an interesting line in the, I think it was in the New York Times. She said it's it's not just about a new technological; it's a new form of capitalism. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit sort of Blade Runner-ish, you know, off-world colonies, I think, of that movie. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's sort of the next phase of, so there's all the things I've got of, you know, the narcotic potential of living in a space like that in terms mm -hmm. of it just being all immersive. But then also I ask the question is, what does that mean for holding back the power of these, you know, companies? And a lot of like conservative thought has always been about holding back big government, but the size of mm. these companies. I mean, Australia was recently simultaneously being sort of bullied by China and Google all at the same time. Um, you know, but what does it look like if there's a metaverse? Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, it's going to be fascinating. It's interesting. The argument about big government is almost irrelevant now. Yeah. And forget the separation of church and state. We need a separation mm -hmm. of corporation and state. The reality is that John D. Rockefeller's empire was broken into 34 companies. And one of those companies, mm -hmm. Chevron, just last week, sent a person to the pr to prison. It's the first case of corporate prosecution. And you, his name's wow. Steven Donzinger, and he's in jail now because he got an eight and a half billion dollar fine against him and they just ruined his life. Like, wow. and that's that's one of the 34 companies that came out of Standard Oil. Whatever Google gets smashed into, one of those mm. pieces is just going to be the Hydra that rares back. Like mm. I was telling my mm. Sunday school kids this week, they're all teenagers and they all live in Fortnite and Minecraft and all this stuff. Mm. And uh, I was like, listen, either like Zuckerberg is basically saying we will enter into Facebook's world and be bombarded with advertising and Russian trolls, et cetera, or we will put on glasses and Facebook will enter our world via augmented yes. reality. And I don't, I don't know what's worse. Like, cause at least you can, you know, you can take the headset off and be like, okay, I've had my yes. two hours in the metaverse. Once it's in a, a, a lens or in a pair of glasses, it's just, it's always going to be with us. It's very strange. Yes. And obviously there are cost benefits to it. I would love to be able to walk down the street, see a flower I've never seen before, click my glasses and know what that flower is. That would be great, yes. right? But I don't want it done advertising to me. You should buy a mm. pack of these seed flowers for your work. Mm. Uh, oh, the, totally. the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth um, major change, um, would love your thoughts on the rise of central bank digital currencies. Uh, obviously crypto mm. just hit. Three trillion dollars, mm. and it's, everyone's mm. freaking out about it. It's a giant Ponzi scheme. Mm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Mm. Yeah, well, I think in some ways, I think it's the same story almost as our last point. It's really the battle. Like central central banks are effectively 
um, if you go back to that period in history and you know, look after the Great Depression, it was the, it was the state's ability to pull back the market, have mm-hmm. some lever of control. Um, so in many ways, I think that um, crypto is a rebellion against that. And it has, again, it, 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 there's two stories. There can be the story of people who you know, are fighting back the small man. You hear the stories of in the two-thirds world in countries where they don't trust their central banks and there's you know, endemic corruption. And if they go down to the local bank, they can get robbed or have money taken out or the government mm-hmm. can take the money. You know, a really helpful thing. But then you can also see the effect that it could just be like already we see cryptocurrencies are a bit of a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, the effect that that could have on the um, you know the economy. So I think cryptocurrencies contain they're they're not ideologically free. They definitely are an ideological, mm-hmm. I would say, a form of libertarianism. Um, so yeah, I, I, it, it could. There just feels crypto could be one of a number of things at the moment that feels like a giant bubble. Mm. Um, you know, and I think about the Dutch and the tulips. You know, and <laughs> they all were selling their houses to buy tulips. It was in the 18th century or 16th century, and you know, part of me wonders. You know, either this is going to be the new thing mm-hmm. or not. But I think governments through creating their own central bank type currencies and even the metaverse. Like part of me is like, how much is the metaverse? A Facebook, his attempt to get the Facebook currency. Mm. You know, China's talking about a digital. Um, currency, uh, yeah. So I think there's going to be this toing and froing. Um, I can't remember who said it, but someone said it that it's interesting that there's all these things that have been polarized. So certain things will go either way. You know what I mean? Like they, they take a while. Like early COVID, a lot of the actual Republicans and people like Steve Bannon were like, "We need to take this seriously because it's a way of getting back <laughs> to China." And then it sort of went to the other side a bit. And digital currency hasn't fallen anywhere yet. Exactly, I think it mm. will. Um, but yeah, I, I think it'll be polarized at some point. Um, so I think that'll be part of the next story. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, what I see coming uh, specifically for CBDCs is uh, once once countries start releasing their own digital surveillance currencies where they have the ability to not only print it like they always have, but now they can track it and control yeah. it and turn it off and cancel people financially. I think what we're going to see is a Thucydides trap, right? With, mm. with you know, what happens when a rising Athen, Athens comes up against the established Sparta? The two are, it's in, the clash is inevitable because mm. government is going to want to hold on to its ability to control wealth and people are tired of that. So it's going to be a Thucydides mm. trap. I think what's mm. going to happen though is the war between those two is going to be so devastating that it's going to end up being a Pyrrhic victory that winning mm. is tantamount to losing. It leaves both mm. in, in just shattered leaving room for a third party Persia, something from the East, probably a China CBDC Mm. that is still centralized to come in and just become the new world reserve currency. Mm. So at the end of this, whether it's crypto or or USD, at the end of the day, it's, I don't think that the USD is going to be the world reserve currency anymore. I think its days are seriously numbered. Yeah. And that's the big shift then of the post American world order. Yeah, Mm. for sure. Um, what have been some of the most interesting books or pieces you've read in the past 18 months? And what are you reading now? Yeah, so I just finished um, Who Dares Wins by Damien, uh, Damien Sandbrook, which is a history of Britain, 1979 to 1982. Um, and it's fascinating reading it, how similar a lot of the themes. I've been reading his um, State of Emergency uh uh I forgot the other one. So it's basically 1975. So it's this really social history of Britain. But what I found so interesting is some of the similarities. Like I thought things, mm. it's, I, th- I almost read it to like, I don't want to, because I often read at night and I'm thinking about stuff all day. So I almost want to escape, but I couldn't escape in some ways of, you know, look how much an issue of Europe was in Britain the whole time um, since you're, you know, Britain mm-hmm. joined the European. So it was like Brexit is this, this trail through. Really interesting. I just read, you know, the chapters on um, the riots um, in Britain, in, in uh, Toxithan, um and Brixton and you know, issues of race um, coming up and just very mm. similar to 2020. Um, just these issues of uh, sort of like declining trust in institutions, um, sort of the sovereignty, again, that sovereignty over the Falkland Islands uh, mm-hmm. was really interesting. So just so many, I, I sort of having this like feeling that a lot of these things, do we forget? So my question is, 
do th- are things are new and they're definitely things new like metaverse and so on but even even the metaverse is brilliant but there was a guy who i forgot what the computer was called but britain for a while had one of the biggest selling personal computers in the world i've forgotten the name of it and like he went to japan the guy who made it and gave this speech and he sort of gave this big speech in like 1982 about how the future is going to be this virtual reality and it's like this this it's like it's predicting what's happening now but the audience is just shocked you know mm. that it's coming mm. so it's just fascinating in 1982 it's all there um and and they almost do like even the fashions there was desire to go back to the past as well there was like brideshead revisited was <laughs> remade at that time and it was one of the biggest things in britain and and even like Princess Diana's fashion was sort of influenced by Brideshead Revisited. Mm-hmm. It was just, oh, yeah, so fascinating, the, the parallels. Uh, folks, for those who haven't heard of um, Brideshead Revisited, it's basically the story of this like very posh Etonian who goes to visit a countryside manor and it's just the life of the rich and famous in Edwardian mm-hmm. times, basically. Yes. Very decadent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, totally. It's d- Downton Abbey, for, yes. yeah, sort of yeah. almost, yeah, that sort of feel. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been interested. I read um, Brenda Messias' uh, book on America, which I found really fascinating, uh, which is called, uh, I'm so bad on book titles. Like I can, I remember what's in them. It should be here somewhere. Uh, I will, so Brenda Messias, his book, <laughs> History Has Begun. Uh, and his, his thesis, I thought a lot about, it's probably been one of the most influential books. I don't agree with where he gets in the end, but his argument is that, America is in a, a, a continuing search for freedom is really what is the heart of the American story. Freedom, the freedom or autonomy? Um, well, they're sort of together, he, yeah. he would argue, to the point where um, the new frontier then becomes... So he talks about the fact that America never really has a socialism as it does in other Western countries yeah. because instead of forming a union, you know, or you, I mean, there, there was unions, but... You just kept going further. So instead of getting utopia where you were, you actually just kept going mm-hmm. further west. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you have the you know Kennedy administration, which is the new frontier of this you know sort of boffins space, the final frontier of Captain Kirk, mm-hmm. uh, and then you cyberspace is the new frontier. But he says the new frontier is fantasy, and so his sort of read of uh, US is fantasy. So it's really interesting his read on like woke stuff and even sort of MAGA stuff. He calls them almost metaverses before the metaverse. Mm-hmm. So you can live in this world where, you know, all these different genders mean something to you. And there's this whole language of pronouns and stuff like that, which only a certain small group of people actually can use and understand. Mm-hmm. Or you can live in this world where Trump's the one and, you know, the election's going to be overturned at any moment. And, but they're metaverses before wow. the metaverse. Yeah. And so, yeah, his, his, his thing is fantasy. So America's sort of desire for freedom has pushed into a kind of fantasy um, and that's sort of like, you know, how we see the pandemic where, you know, you've almost got two Americas, one who is trying to work with the pandemic, the other is acting like it doesn't exist, you yeah. know, because like you can have you, whatever fantasy you want to leave in. Um, so that, that's been really, um, I think, one of the most sort of, yeah, books I've thought a lot about. Um, hmm. uh, I've been studying The Life of David. <laughs> uh, and read Archie Kendall's uh, book, A Man After God's Heart and The Making of a Man of God by Alan Redpath, both sort of older books. Mm. But I've just found David this really fascinating character to reflect upon and a, a man who lived just a really fascinating life in and led in fascinating times. So that's been, a, so I mean, really some cultural stuff, but at the same time reading David off it, mm-hmm. which has been a really interesting um, sort of, I guess, experience. And it's not one book, but I read a lot of, so I've got, I've got a new book coming out next year, but really interested in the idea of shifting from, uh, so I read a lot in this area, shifting from a complicated world to a complex world. Mm. And the idea that the pandemic is in many ways preparation for an increasingly complex systematic world where we're used to this almost industrial world. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I read, um, uh, again, too, I'm so bad with books, but uh their their titles um we'll be able to check the bibliography of your book when it comes out yes yes <laughs> so yeah so I read a number of books on that i won't i won't uh <laughs> yes pause for too long here trying to remember them all um you mentioned uh in our email exchange that you've been reading the new peter Thiel biography and you said that it's been making you relook at the history of the last five years in a new light can you explain that Yes. So for those who don't know, Peter Thiel is uh, um, many things. 
he's sort of a public intellectual hedge fund manager, uh, manager of a large part of the CIA and a number of other Western intelligence agencies, data processing. Um, rumored hyper, to hyper libertarian billionaire with a hyper, New Zealand yeah. bunker. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, grew up evangelical Christian in Germany. Um, migrated with his family, went to work in Namibia. And so he lived part of his life in Namibia, South Africa. Came back to Stanford. And at Stanford, um, sort of gets frustrated at the sort of, this is the 90s, the sort of, for want of a better term, you know, university left, woke at the, you know, mm -hmm. what we call woke now, all that sort of stuff. Um, and writes this book about it, but sort of doesn't get any sort of traction. Um, but then also sort of comes up with this really interesting Christian version of Christianity. Um, so he's really in the, into the theologian Rene Girard, who um, uh, is sort of an interesting thinker and has this idea of this, the scapegoat, that's, that society needs scapegoats to sort of put mm -hmm. their, um, you know, blame upon and that Jesus acts as this sort of scapegoat and, you know, has this cultural reading. But it's interesting, he sort of takes it. And at Stanford, they have a chapel, which is um, a chapel where they... It's, it's like that, it's Judeo-Christian. So it's not purely Christian. It's like a university post-denominational chapel mm. that has rabbis and Christians there, but it's sort of like cultural Christian. Now Stanford also was sort of the intellectual hub of a lot of Reagan thought. And I think the Reagan, uh, might be a Reagan, maybe there's a little Reagan library there, I'm not sure. Um, so it's this really interesting milieu where you've got this mm -hmm. sort of, and you think this is in the nineties for what's happened now, you've got this sort of, um, near Silicon Valley. So you got the libertarian Silicon Valley thing. You got this sort of Reaganomics thing going on as well, Reagan thought. And what's the next iteration of it? You've got this Judeo-Christian, uh, cultural Christian thing going on. Then you got this reaction against the woke left. Then interestingly as well, he, he on campus, and, and there's some dispute over this in the biography, um, but he was also pro-apartheid, defending the apartheid regime on campus Jeez. at the same time, which is really interesting sort of when you go, oh, hang on, that's really <laughs> interesting. So he's just one of those people that um, he, he uh, did PayPal with Elon Musk. Um, there's the talk of the, the, talk of the teal verse, mm -hmm. which is all these thinkers. And I won't go through all of them, but, you know, there's Musk. Um, he also is one of the funders of Facebook. He provided, if, he's, if you've seen the movie, um, The Social Network, he's played in it. He gives a lot of the money to get Facebook mm. off the ground. Interestingly, some of the money for that comes from a, a hedge fund called QIntel. Also, he's, I think he starts his group, uh, Palantir, which is named after the Lord of the Rings, yeah. being stones. Um, so it's his intelligence thing. Um, that's hedge fund from QIntel, which is a Silicon Valley hedge fund by the, by, uh, the CIA. So then there's this really weird CIA intelligence service thing and all of this. Um, but what I found interesting reading the book is a lot of the characters that emerged at the beginning of 2016 or just before then, pushing back on the woke thing online, a lot of the alt-right trolls, Peter Thiel was actually sponsoring a lot of them, which is really interesting. So a lot of those people who seem to organically emerge, Peter Thiel was actually sort of sponsoring mm. them. But then you sort of read on and then you realize like a lot of the crypto thinkers um, and he's also sponsoring and, and um, thinking about, and then even now there's sort of what they call the post woke left and there's the dirt bag left and mm -hmm. there's podcasts like Red Scare and so on. He's also behind some of those thinkers. And then, and then there's the weird thing. I don't know if you remember there was, uh, what was it called? Was it, uh, there was a college in the U S where there was a, um, uh, uh, a, um, like there was sort of a woke, controversy and there was a guy I think it was Brett Weinstein was this college professor and he sort of became this core celeb because he was a left guy but he pushed back on this sort of university um sort of you know was seen as the millennial woke you know sort of new guard coming to get him um and his brother Eric Weinstein has actually become you know quite a big name now he's got a podcast and he's part of what they call the intellectual dark web Eric is actually I think he manages Peter Thiel's hedge fund and so like Quillette Journal, which Claire Lehman does out of Sydney, which sort of that, they're also linked to some of this money as well. So it's this, you start to look at this and it's, wow. it's, not, it's not so much from a conspiracy theory, but part of what you begin to realise is going on is that if there's sort of a culture war um, and, uh, you know, people sort of like are sort of fighting here, in some ways that furthers the goals of people who want to sort of push back on, on government regulation. So fine, mm -hmm. I could go on the whole thing. What I found fascinating too is the role of the pandemic. 
So before the pandemic, um, some of the libertarians in Chile and so on already had beef with Fauci and Francis Collins mm. and the FDA and CDC because they saw them as regulatory bodies. That and now Fauci is the devil. Exactly. So you realize that there was, yeah. So it's just one of those books. I'm just reading this, having followed all this stuff going, mm. oh my goodness, there's more going on behind the scenes here. Um, and then, you know, finally, like weird things like he's, he's sort of pushing back on China, but then also, um, you know, he's sort of partnering with people like Eric Prince, who did Blackwater. Um, the mercenary group Goodness. who are doing the frontier private services army. Group, yeah. private yeah. army who, who also does front, frontier services group providing security for Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, it's just one of those books which I came away. Go, I got to think about this. But then weirdly, he'll do like talks with um, Tom Wright and or did a debate with Tom Wright, and is still in the sort of Christian space. It's it's yeah, it's really that's an, it's an, like, that's anti right for uh, North Americans. Yes. Yeah. yeah so yes. Um, and then um, sort of final thing, you know, it was very much a big advisor to Trump, spoke mm. at Trump's inauguration, um, but also he's behind, you know, linked to Michael Flynn, mm. Josh Hawley. Sorry, final comment on, on that. <laughs> so Josh Hawley, who wrote the book Against Big Tech, he's like, he's connected to Peter Thiel. So it's this weird thing where you look at these pushback on big tech, more of it's actually a pushback on Google and other things so that, you know, they can compete if yeah. there's pushback on some of these competitors. Yeah. Oh, so man. yeah, fascinating, fascinating book. Man, it's so interesting because, you know, Teal is a leave me alone libertarian, but yet he's one of the most controlling guys on planet earth. Like he's, he's, he basically runs the CIA. Like it's, it's mm. shocking how you can kind of hold both those things in your head somehow. Um, I, I've come to the point where I feel like almost every movement in society is actually just sponsored. Like we've, tried to commodify everything else. Why would ideology be any different? Um, Cicero and the ancient Romans, they always said, qui bono, who profits? So any mm. of these new, like, where does this new theory come from? Who profits? Like, you know, anti-vax, it's obvious. It's like, oh, well, the Ivermectin people are making a killing, you know, <laughs> like mm. the, the podcasters, the, the health mama mm. blogs, like people are mm. profiting from whatever the, the new thing is. But it's mm. yeah, Peter Thiel is a fascinating guy. And uh, mm. a lot of the Bitcoiners online, they're these like, f they call themselves Christians and they're like all about family stuff and leave me alone. But they like hate people. Like it's a very yes. strange Christendom we're entering the digital age of Christendom. Yes. Yes. So yeah. we're, we're living in an age of accelerating change, but humans mm. are extremely change averse and our biology mm. barely moves. Plus we serve an unchanging God. How can Christians better live amidst the post-modernity maelstrom? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that connection to the eternal, I think, is, is your anchor. Mm. And it's interesting, too, like, there was an article yesterday here in our, in our newspaper, um, our sort of equivalent of PBS um, online, um, and it was written by a guy, Stan Grant. He's a, a journalist, Indigenous man, um, really smart. And he was talking about, you know, so this, this, you know, is the West in trouble with a rising mm -hmm. China? Really interesting. He was quoting from Carl Truman's book. Um, uh, there's a Christian writer, which a lot of people are, are reading his book, which I thought fascinating. Like, why is he reading that? That's really interesting. And I read this and, and there's a lot of articles about the, the sort of like decline of the West, you know, and, you know, I thought another easy this. target, right? Exactly. Yeah. And this fear that you can see comes up in both the left and the right, mm -hmm. you know, there's the, the right who are like, oh, we're losing our traditional way. And, you know, where's culture going? The left are like, oh, we're losing. Look, you know, Russia's winning and, and Erdogan's winning and G's winning. Um, you know, and I thought about this and I thought yeah, history always changes. Mm. You know, like God has this huge, huge viewpoint. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like there's this sense that by us being connected to the eternal, it actually makes us continually relevant mm. um, because you see the long game. And yes. you see that political phases come and go. You see that, you know, technological change happens, but it never happens in the way we thought. Mm -hmm. The metaverse will probably play out very differently in ways no one could, could expect it to. Um, you know, if, if the borders change, you know, these borders mm -hmm. and these countries that we're in, you know, some of them, Australia is only a couple hundred years old and um, as a nation. And, you know, I, I, I see that actually the always connection to the eternal is what gives us continual relevance yes. 
Um, and it, you know, there's a the classic saying: if you you know you marry the spirit of the age, you get divorced in the next. <laughs> and I think that that's that connection to the unchanging God makes us eternally relevant and gives mm. us a really interesting viewpoint at this moment. Um, mm. You know, I really believe you know, like big big um, reader of um, Leslie Newbigin, and you know, he said that almost. Yeah, anyone to read their culture has to have a cross-cultural experience. It's like when you, yeah. I find it, I, I learn more about Australia when I'm outside of Australia because you're like, oh, they don't do that here. Or, and the pandemic's been that. The pandemic has been this amazing cultural reveal of how different mm. countries react. And you think you're talking about the same thing, but you're not. Mm. And even within countries like, like Canada, the way the different provinces have reacted so differently in Australia, our states. I used to look at Canada and go, the difference between Canada and Australia is their states or their provinces are more different. The pandemic has shown no, our states is our states are just as different from, you know, as Canada. Mm -hmm. So you don't know your culture until it's tested. So I feel like we always have this cross-cultural experience, even if you never leave your country, because your country is also heaven. And so mm -hmm. that gives you this cross-cultural mm -hmm. experience back to where you are. Yeah. So my wife and I, we live, uh, we moved uh, right before the pandemic. We live in the UK now. So we've gotten to enjoy mm -hmm. the insanity that is Brexit and fuel shortages yes. and beef price rises and gas companies going bankrupt and all the craziness of politics in this country. Um, but every morning I go on a walk and it takes me at one point through um, a thousand year old uh, monastery ruins. <clears throat> and um, there's a, there's a sign, a plaque out front that it says that um, after the dissolution of the monasteries, that all the stone of the monastery became a convenient quarry for the town. And they stripped it and they built their homes out of the stones. And when I read that phrase, a convenient quarry, I thought, isn't that mm. Christianity? You know, mm. you're, you're famous for the saying, the kingdom without the king. Mm. Uh, uh, culture has basically said like, oh, we love your hospitals. We love your human mm. rights. We love your universities. Mm. Christianity has been a convenient uh, quarry for secularism mm. to grab institutions. I think next mm. is maybe they start grabbing our values, but they can never grab our motivations. They can yes, never yes. get to the why behind what we do, what mm. we do. And th these mm. institutions were simply, they were birthed out of the good soil of love, mm. right? He loved mm. us. And so we love each other. Mm. And you can't mm. manufacture that and copy that in it. In, mm. in any country on earth. Mm. And even just, uh, just to add a point there, so real quick is, I think even Christians who are wanting, almost, a, you know, because a lot of people now ask getting me to talk about what well, this is the rise of Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. And there's even an element where they may even want cultural Christianity. And it's been interesting, like what's happening in Poland and Hungary and these places. And I was talking to a pastor in Hungary and he's like, you know, grew up under communism. So I had the government against him. And now is this weird thing where the government's throwing money at him mm -hmm. and trying to promote Christian values. Not that many people are going back to church, um, but it's all about Christian values. But he's like, I know that there's a price with this money. Yeah. And one day I'll be asked something. So even that, I even feel like it could get to the point. Uh, one of my predictions is you could see a cultural collapse where people are like, oh, we want to get back to our Christian values, but it may not be the church <laughs> and the kingdom. Interesting. Um, and we've seen that throughout history. That, that's a possible future for us. Oh, interesting. Uh, three questions left. So mm. um, the Romans had a punishment for desertion or insubordination called decimation, where mm. they would break their cohort of 450 soldiers down into groups of 10, and then they would draw straws, and whoever got the short straw would be clubbed, stabbed, or strangled to death by their other, the other nine mm. in their cohort. So it was a literal decimation, a moving of the decimal point. Mm. I believe that the church is, because I am so focused on kids and teens, mm. we are witnessing the decimation of the church, that the, the decimal mm. point is literally going to move over mm. as Gen Z leaves the church and Gen Alpha mm. has never heard of the church. Um, mm. Do you have any stirrings on how the church can reach Gen Z and Gen Alpha? One of my mm. um, kids, pastor friends, his name's Andrew. He said, I'd be curious to know of any movements or patterns Mark um, is mm. seeing that God might want to teach leaders how to foster a gospel resilience in kids through mm. the church. Mm. I couldn't name any movements per se, but I think something's happening. So it's really interesting. If you look at one of the things for millennials, and there's been a lot of talk about millennials and so on in the church mm. and um, Millennials grew up at a time and were formed at a time of the economic boom. Alan Greenspan said, we're potentially heading into a never-ending boom 
you know, uh, which obviously you know, is not going to happen. Um, and so that raised expectations. You know, it was this period of a, a tremendous peace. My daughter's 13, so she's Gen, Gen Z, Gen Z. And um, I remember early on in the pandemic, in that first sort of six weeks when the whole world was going crazy and everyone was buying toilet paper, um, we went down to the supermarket, me and her, and it was just crazy. And it was like all the meat was gone, all the all the vegetables. And um, you know, she was with me and she, I could just see her looking around and she was looking at this. And um, this guy came up to us and he, he, he looked like the guy from... Um, he had an American accent. He looked at the doc from Back to the Future. <laughs> he just uh, said to us, he goes, he's in Lebanon for that. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was like, this is like Moscow, 960 or something. And then sort of walked off and we were like, oh, wow, that was like a movie. And, you know, I was walking home after that with my daughter and I realized like there's been a lot of programs. So not anymore, but the Catholic school across from our office had this big sign. We're part of the resilience project about three years ago, you know, trying to build resilience in kids. But I began to wonder, I thought, ultimately I think resilience is built by the environment. And I sort of feel like having lived through this pandemic and, um, you know, having lived, I think, living through what is coming, like the world is, um, you know, I had, I had a Gen Z, Gen Z said to me, you know, like millennials were looking at the world going, oh, why hasn't all my dreams come true? And and they said, Gen Z is like, their wishes, I hope I don't die. So, you know, <laughs> the world doesn't end, you know? So, so I, I wonder whether it's actually going to be, how, how do we as leaders, parents, um, influences of, of those generations actually help them live actually in the environment that mm -hmm. we're in. And even it's how we react to it, because maybe maybe they're, they're going to be normal. They talked about digital natives. Mm, yeah. Maybe they're actually going to be disruption natives. Mm. And, you know, me who never as a kid ever thought that the supermarkets will be empty, maybe actually there's an opportunity here um, where they're looking at the world and nature has returned. One of my things like um, is... You know, I've thought about this, that modernity promised to beat nature. So there's this idea that, that you could yes. not need God because, hey, we've conquered nature. Nature's returning, the environment, mm. pandemics. And so they're seeing it. There is actually a, a, a worry. They go to their schools. They're going to get COVID. You know, there's all this mm. sort of stuff out there. And, and so I think it's more how do we take the opportunity to disciple them in this environment of disruption? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's crazy. They're kids to so like i i was born in 86 so the mm. moment where i realized the world wasn't happy and good was 9 11 right my mm. 10th grade history class getting interrupted my teacher saying you are going to witness history today rushes us down mm. to the main and we see the second plane smash into the buildings wow. my high school kids they've lived through two recessions <laughs> they've lived through a mm. pandemic they've lived through mm. unending wars their mm. view of the world is like oh the world is terrible and mm -hmm. if, if, if they care about politics, which they rarely do, it's, mm -hmm. well, obviously we should all be socialists. It's like, oh no, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just like, let's give the, the state all the authority. Um, mm -hmm. but, but mostly though, it's irrelevant to them. They don't, kids don't hold beliefs anymore. They, mm -hmm. they say they don't hold beliefs because they're just online. They don't really need to hold yes. a belief. If they can order mm -hmm. stuff to the house, they're okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah. I don't see What's anyone- interesting who's really leading on this in the church. Like, no. where, where are the people who are like, yeah, Gen Alpha, we know how we can reach Gen Alpha. Mm. Like their kids mm. are eight years old and they all have phones already. Like we know how to, mm. to help disciple them in the metaverse world they're growing up in. Like they're going to be the first generation that's like meta natives, you know, like yes, yes, puberty, yes. they're going to be growing up in the metaverse. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yes. Oh, and I was just going to say, it's, it's interesting too. Like there's one thing which I'm fascinated by. This is like a bit of a curve for potential future is... I had this thing like that's oh, about six months ago. Was like, what are the guys who are trying to think about the future? What are they worried about? Yeah. And this idea of the digital pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the internet becomes increasingly unwieldy. So we've been in a, just as we've been in a smooth world where it's been easy to fly across the world, you know, to worry about tests and you know, countries are open. That world, you know, I used to be able to get on a plane, go to London, use my Uber, and it just was all very easy, you know. Um, that, and the internet's been like that. So we can just, you know, in countries around the world, you can put your church on YouTube and all, everyone can stream it. But the fact that the internet's breaking up into sort of a Chinese internet, a Russian internet, a EU internet, American internet, um, plus also cyber attacks, increased viruses, um, you know, blocking, cancelling, you know, a sort of dark web over here, metaverse over here, competing. 
Um, the idea that the internet could even go down for periods. I mean, they just, someone just like, you know, probably, I shouldn't guess, maybe Israel. <laughs> you know, all the petrol bowsers in, in Iran went offline for a period there at their actual thing, you know, and the, the suspect is Israel did this. So that, mm -hmm. but there's these things blowing up around the world. Like the internet of things also becomes another weapon to use. For sure. So there is a possibility. I said this because there was a lot of people like when the pandemic happened is the future is digital church and, you know, everyone's going to get a line, get ready. And, and then I, I said it a thing about six months later, I said, well, you also could be prepared that there could be like periods where the internet goes offline. I mean, I think Lebanon's about to lose the internet yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's another interesting future. Or even does our energy needs to power something like the metaverse, you know, they're not matching, you know what I mean? Mm. As we sort of try and get to zero or whatever. Um, yeah, so it could even be, that's a curveball that no one's seeing that a, a generation, there was this Dom DeLillo book, which I ordered, um, a novel where he he talked about what if the internet just went and I got the book and it was the best idea. It was honestly about that thick. And it was like, man, I don't know what's going on here. Cause he hasn't delivered a book to his publisher in time. Cause it was this great idea, but honestly it was about 20 pages. And I thought that could have been the best novel, but it's an interesting idea. Like what happens if the internet went, you mm -hmm. know, um, not out of the realms of possibility. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Um, yeah. The, Probably my favorite week of being a teenager was when we had the Eastern seaboard blackouts and it was just a week of, what are we going to do? I guess we'll hang out with our neighbors. <laughs> like you've lived yes. for 10 years and now you're like spending time with them. One thing that I think is going to be like, it's not an either or it's a false dichotomy. You'd be mm. like, we're going to live in the metaverse. Or we're going to be Amish or Mennonite again. You know, it's, it's mm. not like that. It's mm. going to be both. There are going to be people who are going to go hardcore offline and they're going to be people who just mm. never leave the metaverse. Um, what I think the limitation we are going to come up against though, is that humans, God created us biological. We are mm. messy bags of spiritual chemicals, you know, like mm. we are mm. like, our eyes are not myopia rates mm. have doubled in a generation. Mm. The kids are mm. short sighted now because, because they're mm. spending so much time on screens. That's going to be a huge limiting factor for the metaverse is mm. we mm. are physically embodied human beings and i think i think the church really has a chance to lead into that one of my pastor friends he said i go fishing online to pull people into real community you know he's mm -hmm. using the internet mm -hmm. as a tool to get people this whole idea of like yeah well our whole church will be a digital church and we'll do digital baptisms mm -hmm. and all this stuff it's like mm -hmm. there is there is something that we will never escape as biological beings yes yes two more questions yeah. almost done mm -hmm. Um, what are the major risks most Christians and people in general are unprepared for right now? Yeah, I, I think I think what it is is multiple changes happening simultaneously. So I think that we like to hedge and think about the big change that's coming, but we don't think about six changes happening simultaneously. Mm. So like the pandemic came and everyone's like, oh my goodness, it's a pandemic. I can't believe this has happened, even though it's been predicted for a long time. Yeah. Um, it was it was always going to be a respiratory. It was coming. You know, there was books about it. Um, but then what we're seeing now, this is turning into a supply chain issue. This is turning into an inflation issue. This is the geopolitical orders changing. It's turning into a climate issue. It's how do you deal with a multiplicity of changes all the time where that's the new normal? And, you know, I feel like that's what people aren't thinking about. And you can plan. I think what we've, we've done in the church and even in our lives is this industrial age thinking where, you know, our lives are, I'm going to do these 20 things and I can plan and next year's holidays look like this and I'm going to mm -hmm. save this money away and next Tuesday I'm going to go and do this. Disruption and what we've experienced in the last sort of two years, I don't think that's going to go away. Now, we may be able to plan better, mm -hmm. um, but I feel like what we're not being prepared for is that it's not going back to 2019. And if COVID goes away tomorrow, someone invents a super pill that costs nothing and we can distribute to the entire world, the, the age of acceleration is here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's not just about technology. It's that we're coming out of an epoch. And, and my, my language I'm using it for is increasingly gray zone. So, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Ukraine, and we're seeing this in Belarus at the moment, um, Belarusians are taking Iraqis and Syrians and Yemenis and, and sort of taking them to the border of Poland and Lithuania. And is it war or what is it? Mm -hmm. This is not war because they're not firing guns, but they're mm -hmm. using strobe lights and lasers and people and there's batons and, um, you know, there's cyber disinformation. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's where does war begin and where does war end? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a similar thing that ages are organized into eras or epochs. 
but they're never clearly begin and end. Yeah. Like in many ways, the dark ages or late antiquity was a gray zone in between the ancient time, antiquity and the medieval period. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite movies is um, uh, The Third Man um, uh, with Orson Welles in the lead. And mm -hmm. what I love about that movie, it's set in Vienna at the end of World War II. And I saw it as a kid and I could never get my head, I hated it as a kid because I loved World War II movies. And it was very clear, here's the allies, either British or Americans, and here's the Germans. And the Germans are bad and the British Americans are good. And, but in The Third Man, it's <clears> like, <throat> who is good, who is bad? The city's divided into mm -hmm. four. And the Americans actually is the bad guy in the movie. And the final scene is Harry Lyme played by Orson Welles. He's this American who's become corrupted in the black market. And there are Austrian troops with the old German army helmets chasing him and you want them to get the guy. So it plays with all the categories. And I feel like that's what gray zones do. Nothing's mm. defined. You've got elements of the old era, elements of the new era. And I don't think we're prepared. We're, we've, been, we've been raised, particularly of us in the West, the developed world, to deal with gray zones very well. Mm -hmm. But I think that's living <clears throat> in gray zones potentially for the rest of our lives until a new era forms at some stage. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the biggest danger because it, it affects you in a particular way if you have high expectations and you want to control your environment. Yeah. So then the last question is, what are the opportunities for Christians, pastors, churches, and denominations? Um, what are we missing right now opportunities-wise? And what are the key shifts mm -hmm. that leaders need to be making right now? Mm -hmm. I think we are. And sorry, and the context of this yeah, is yeah. a lot of churches are going back and they're literally like, okay, we're done. And they're going right back to what they were doing before. They're not reaching yeah. kids. They're still singing the same songs. They're still doing the same mm. order of service. Nothing is changing. Mm. What are mm. the opportunities that uh, they need to be mm. executing? Well, I think the first one is there is a huge, I think, evangelistic opportunity in the world. And, you know, uh, George Hunter said, you know, with, when explaining the gospel to people, look for the gaps between idols. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, I know Philip Jenkins had research that when someone comes from a Buddhist or Hindu country to the West, even though the West, you know, we call it secular, there's a significant chance they become a Christian because they're coming into a new environment and, you know, there's a life change. And, and when people may go through bereavement or divorce or job loss or these things, they often become Christian, even childbirth. Mm -hmm. um, they become Christian because there's like, oh, I'm thinking about the world differently. We are seeing so many idols in the world um, and ideologies mm -hmm. fall. And, and my thing is, it's like everything's being humiliated. Like governments are being humiliated, militaries, countries, left and right, everything, libertarianism, central government, everything is being humiliated. Um, and I use the word humiliated because, you know, it says in Colossians, you know, Christ humiliated the powers mm -hmm. uh, on the cross. And so I feel like it's this age where everything, you can't trust anything. And there's a sense where Christians are missing out because we're freaking out about that because it threatens us. And there's an element of like, hang on, I've, I've placed my trust in that idol. So our idols are being revealed, but there's a huge evangelistic opportunity at this moment. Mm. I feel like the second thing is that what I realized is there is this incredible moment for creativity because in those gray zones, often gray zones and cities and, and places like Odessa was this interesting place in between sort of, like Central Asia, it's in Russia, but it's, it's in Ukraine, but there's like Central Asia and then Western Europe. And it became this great hub of different like uh, races and ethnicities and artists and writers. And you see that throughout history, Constantinople, um, you know, the Silk Road, mm -hmm. um, Southern China, Hong Kong, these places where there's all this stuff going on and tensions often are the most creative places because people have to think differently and they have to act differently. And I feel like that's where we're at this point in time. Mm. You know, I feel like one thing that got busted and we can't go back is cultural Christianity, that you're going to do a church service because the amount of pastors I spoke to in the pandemic who were like, I lost a significant percentage of my church in six weeks. And I, I, I'll put my hand up. That, that happened to us too. Yeah. Not, not We didn't lose a significant, but there were people who literally after, who'd been in our church for years who after six weeks were, I'm out, you know? And I had a friend in, uh, in Sydney who's a pastor and he, he rang around after six weeks after the first lockdown. It was like, where are you at? And there were people like, yeah, I've thought about it. I don't believe. And like, my question is, what were we doing? Yeah. What were we doing? Like, what were we doing wrong that those people could come for 10 years? Mm -hmm. And, oh, it's a social thing. It's what I do. I just used to it. And so I feel like that model we can't go back to. But so mm -hmm. much of our model of church has been harvesting those people. And... 
I feel like what we're trying to do at our church, at least, is this is about discipleship now. This is about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and we put off doing membership. So we, we, you know, we, we had membership ages ago. We sort of replanted, hadn't really got around to it. We had a loose membership mm-hmm. and we put it off because it almost went against the fact that we were growing and we had lots of people coming and, oh, we do a membership thing. It's going to be divisive. We just redid it and we actually put quite a high bar. And we're like, you've got to be a real follower of Jesus who's mm-hmm. willing to be accountable and sign up on this, this theological thing and commit that. And we're going to redo it every year. And it's so fascinating. Mm-hmm. And there's people like who have actually had to really weigh. And we didn't go, we're not going to convince you. We're not going to sell yeah. you on it. No if pitch. You want to join this, join up. Yeah. No pitch. If you want to follow us and we're all going to do this together and be the church. And I feel like there's this moment to enter into real discipleship here. Mm. So I think it's an evangelistic opportunity. It's a creativity moment opportunity. And also it's a, it's a discipleship moment. Mm. Lastly, I feel like the, the sovereignty thing and the separatist thing and the local thing is also really important. Like, I feel like I've learned more about the nature of my city and even I've been local. I've been forced mm. to be local. We're in a long lockdown. We couldn't, we had distances we couldn't go. And I walked the streets and was more present in a way I, I have not been. I've traveled a lot. I have not traveled. I've gone, I've had one trip where I went two hours in two years. Um, and before I'd be flying across the world. And I feel really sort of like my love for my city and the area and even mm-hmm. like things like the flora and fauna <laughs> and the seasons I'm more aware mm-hmm. of. And I feel like what we've done is like, this is what this church did in Chicago or New York or whatever, um, London. And, and we've all got to copy that. We live in such different places with different people. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that creativity thing is, yeah, you can learn from other people elements, but remix mm-hmm. it and, and mold it to where you are. So I think that's a really key thing. I'm increasingly thinking like, what, what, what do we need to do in this place to be faithful to the call that Jesus has for us mm-hmm. a, as a church? Last one, finally, it's just been amazing. When I used to go to the UK, I often used to be jealous of the unity often I'd find in places mm-hmm. compared to Australia. Often it'd be competitive in the church in Australia and very, I don't know why, like just distant from each other. In our local municipality here, the pandemic's really brought people together. My wife is now the sort of prayer coordinator mm-hmm. and different churches from different denominational, but also ethnic backgrounds working together my wife, Trudy, then organized in the midst of lockdown, one thing we could do is walk and pray, you know, and over 500 people from all these different churches, from Catholics to um, full gospel, Korean mm. to Baptist to everything, Salvation so Army, walking the streets, praying. So I think there's this opportunity that others are lonely. Like if people are leaving yes. a church, there are other pastors who you may have never spoken to, but are possibly going through what you're going through. And a coffee with them could be a great source of you know camaraderie mm. um or another believer at your work who who you know is trying to manage all of this like so i think that there's huge opportunities at this moment um we're just going to have eyes to see the opportunities uh in the midst of the at the moment one, one final thing to help in the Bruno Masai's wrote another book called the dawn of eurasia and he talked about going to speak to some chinese intellectuals and the chinese intellectuals said to him you westerners you, you tend to think of What's the goal that you want to do in the future? How do you get there? And if anything comes along, it's a problem. He said, what we do is we look at the environment, see how it's changing, mm. and then how can we take advantage of it? And that's, all, that's changed mm. my strategy. I'm less like, what, what, where do we want to be in five years? I'm like, what's the next six months going to look like? How can we take advantage of the kingdom of God and what God's doing in the world and what mm. we can bring to it? So that, that's how I'm looking at all these opportunities. What's, mm. How is the environment changing? Instead of trying to change the environment, it was the unchanging God who helps me serve this environment. Mm. It's so interesting. As you said that, Mark, I was, the thing that came to mind was there are no Michelin starred McDonald's. If we try to do what Hillsong is doing and we try to do what Red Church is doing or, you know, mm. whatever, whatever mega church is, is going on, um, it's the fine dining establishments globally that win the three rosettes and and the fine wines, it's all about the terroir. It's all about the soil. It's mm. all about the local produce. The, it's so special because it's so unique in all of human history. Mm. And that's what every expression of the local church is supposed to be. It's supposed mm. to be unique in all of history. So thank you for mm. uh, your time today, Mark. Um, for those listening, um, Mark is on Twitter at Sayers Mark, Instagram at Mark Sayers. Um, his website is marksayers.co. Um, check out his podcasts, subscribe to This Cultural Moment, 
Rebuilders and Red Church. And um, we'll be giving away a copy of uh, Mark's most recent book, uh, Reappearing Church. Um, look for that in the show notes as well. But yeah, just really grateful for your time again, Mark. It's great to, to look at what's coming and, and uh, there's no point in worrying when we can prepare. And, uh, yes. and God, we already know that God's going to meet us in the future. He's already been there. And, uh, and we just get to, to catch up to what he's going to be doing in and through us. So thank you for, for this great conversation today. Uh, my absolute pleasure. It's been a blast. Thank you for listening to Future Faith. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Mark Sayers, check out all his work online, marksayers.co. Really grateful to have had him on the podcast. If you want to follow Future Faith, um, you can check us out on Substack at jaredbrock.substack.com. Um, I'll also be giving away a copy of Reappearing Church. It will have a nicer cover, I promise. So go to jaredbrock.substack.com to enter for that contest. And then if you could take just a minute and leave a five-star review on whatever podcast uh, app you use, as well as share this on social media or email it to a pastor or a leader or a friend, someone you know uh, who could benefit from this conversation. Future Faith is all about thinking of how we can be um, prayerfully preparing for the things that are coming ahead. And I hope this has been a really helpful conversation. So love to you all and we'll see you next time.